Hi, everyone. I'm John Corcoran, the Executive Director of the American Rose Society. So glad you decided to join us on this Saturday afternoon for our final Horticulture Judging Seminar. We're so glad to have Bill here to talk to us today. And as we go forward through this, I wanted to give a few instructions on how the webinar is going to go. First and foremost, if you have someone with you uh, viewing the computer side by side, please make sure you put the name of who's with you in your chat in the chat pod so that we can have a record of who's attending this webinar. If you had any questions while going through the webinar, uh, you can ask in the question pod as we go through. And once we get to the end of this presentation, uh, we will be answering questions. If you have any questions from last week's uh, webinar, we have someone who can answer that along with any questions you may have for Bill. You'll be asked to raise your hand. We will then ask you to unmute. And on our end, we will also unmute you so you can then ask that question. Thank you again for being a part of the American Rose Society, and we're so glad you're attending today. To introduce Bill, I will ask Ms. Linda Kimmel to introduce him. Linda? Hi, first of all, I wanna thank Bill for coming today to give this program. And also I wanna thank John and Kim who have made it possible to do this online. So thank you everyone who's participated and gave programs and help support this. We do appreciate everything you do for ARS and your local Rose societies. Okay, Bill Kozlicek and his wife, Kathy, live about 15 miles northeast of Philadelphia. They have a quarter acre suburban lot and they grow about a thousand rose bushes and 750 different varieties of roses. Needless to say, I'm sure Bill has no grass or very little grass. Uh, they started with roses back in 1989. The garden was, has grown about every year. They joined the ARS in 1996 and the Philadelphia Rose Society in 97. They have their garden open several times a year for rose societies and local garden club visits. And I would suggest if you ever have a chance to go see Bill's garden, it's outstanding. He has one of the most beautiful climbing rose collections, I think, in one place that you'll ever see. Uh, climbers seem to be his specialty, and he does a wonderful program on that, by the way, uh, which he gave for the Indianapolis Rose Society, and we appreciated it and enjoyed that very much. Bill and Kathy are avid exhibitors. Uh, they exhibit locally, district, and at national rose shows, also photography. And uh, he has served on the board of Philadelphia Rose Society and also West Jersey in several positions, including president, vice president, and editor. He has been awarded the bronze medal from his local rose societies, uh, both of those, Philadelphia and West Jersey. He was awarded the Silver Honor Medal from Penn Jersey District in 2007. He received the ARS Guy Blake Hedrick Award in 2020. And in 2021, his uh, newsletter that he edited won the Gold Medal in Class A. So congratulations, Bill, and thank you. His credentials are well-deserved, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this program. Thank you very much. Okay, today I'm going to be talking about judging hybrid teas. Um, I started judging back in 1999 when I got my three years in. I had probably exhibited in 25 shows already, so they wanted me to go to judging school. I went to judging school and got my shows in. And, uh, don't judge a lot of local shows because everyone wants me to bring roses. So usually it's districts or neighboring districts or national shows I've been judging in. Uh, when you when you judge hybrid teas, you'll have, you'll come up to a table and there's usually a big collection of them, um, big variety. It's a very interesting class to judge. And you'll see some really gorgeous 
roses. Uh, this was a Nicholson collection from one of the national conventions. Uh, judging when you're judging hybrid teas, uh, here's the definition, the exhibition form. is characterized by petals spiraling symmetrically from a high point in the center, yield a solitary bloom born a long straight stem. Abbreviations HG, uh, granite floors, the other classification, the rose having hybrid T form with the tendency to produce multiple blooms like a floribunda. Um, they are both judged the same way. And because they're both judged the same way, um, when it's referred to as hybrid tea throughout the judging manual, it also includes the Grand Flores. Uh, something new uh, since 19 or since 2021. Um, Side buds on a one bloom per stem hybrid tea or Grand Flora used to be a disqualification. They are no longer. Um, Bob Martin had pushed to get rid of a lot of disqualifications when he was in pres president, and uh, this is one of the changes. Um, they're now considered a deduction, but they're no longer a disqualification, and they're only, if they're distracting, that is considered deduction. Uh, stem on stem is another uh, Disqualification for hybrid teas that used to be allowed for old garden roses and shrubs, um, but now it's allowed on any type of rose, um, and it's only considered a disqualification if it's distracting from the beauty of the exhibit. It should be penalized just to the degree of distraction. So if it's you come up to it and you see it, but it's not really distraction, um, very slight deduction or you can even ignore it. And if the stem on stem is below the lip of the vase, um, there is no consequence for the judging. You don't consider anything below the lip of the vase. Um, judges also should not overly penalize uh, immature side buds and or the stem on stem. Um, stem and foliage is only 20% of the total score. So all things being equal on entry without immature side buds and without stem on stem would be considered superior to an entry that does have them, but they're no longer a disqualification. So you want to mark them down a point or two if there's a small stem or a little bit of a growth or even a side bud. Um, we're trying to encourage more exhibitors and do away with a lot of disqualifications. So. Um, a lot of times new exhibitors come in, they get disqualified, they get discouraged, and they may not want to exhibit again. I, I know I've seen that in Philadelphia. We had a lady that exhibited one time. She got a couple of disqualifications and she never brought roses again. So um, this is what we're trying to accomplish with some of the new rules and changes um, that have come in. Also, entries that have multiple stem on stems are permitted, but they may be penalized according to the degree of distraction. Um, it used to be there was you could allow one stem on stem, uh, but not anymore. Sometimes roses produce very short stems after they bloom. So um, to be able to have a long enough stem to put in the vase so it's not just stuck in a quarter inch and it dries up before the show even opens. Um, they're allowing stem on stem now, and there can be multiples of it too. When you're judging one, stu uh, one bloom for stem hybrid teas, um, use the six points of point scoring. Um, the first one is form, is 25 points. Uh, second one is color, 20 points. Third one is substance, 15 points. Stem and foliage is 20. Balance and proportion is 10. And size is also 10. 
which gives you a total of 100 points. Uh, the values a lot of for six prime elements of judging are maximum values for absolute perfection. Um, leeway must be allowed for possibility of encountering a better specimen of that variety, uh, which means basically as you start judging and you see a really good specimen, you don't want to jump right off and give that the full amount of points. Um, you want to leave it down some in case you encounter a better specimen. So you may drop a few points if you, unless you consider it it's totally perfect then you can give it the full amount uh, classic hybrid t form the petals are symmetrically arranged an attractive circular outline tending to a high center um, greatest number of points in the point points scoring system in order for a judge to judge the form, it must be viewed from the top and also from its profile. Uh, from the top, you're looking down, the outer petal should display a circular outline. Uh, the inner petal should begin at a point in the center and gracefully spiral outward. The outer row of petals in a symmetrical pattern, the distance of the petals evenly spaced with no gaps. A uh, greater number of petals in the specimen, the further open the bloom should be. Uh, it can be more readily determined by viewing the bloom. In profile. Uh, when viewed from above, the center should be high, well defined, it must have a sufficient degree of openness so the judge can determine high point in center without imperfections is present. Um, so you want a, a bloom that's not too tight and you want something that's not too open. A uh, bloom that has not obtained this degree must be penalized as lacking the proper form. If a, a bloom is only open a quarter of the way, it doesn't, it's not open enough to fully judge it and give it full points. So um, it needs to be at exhibition stage. Should be no evidence that the center is bald, full nosed, snubbed, confused, or split. Or you don't want to have, where you have more than one center. Also, a recurved petal is a petal that has the edge of it bent backwards, which uh, disturbs the symmetry of the opening of the bloom. And it would also be considered a fault, depending on degree of distraction. Um, this is from the judge's manual showing the form. Uh, the outer petals are reaching that outline. And you can see the center unswirling evenly. Uh, this is the form on the side. You're going to get that triangular shape with the outer petals being out to the horizontal and your center up at the top of the triangle. Uh, what this is telling you here, the many petal roses, the, the bloom should be two thirds to three quarters open. Um, since there's a lot of petals, um, you need it needs to be open more than a, a lightly petaled rose. And on a heavily petal rose, um, ideally they say the, the outer petal should be on a horizontal plane, but if you get a very heavily petal rose, sometimes those petals will drop have to drop below that horizontal um, to let the bloom up to its you know most beautiful form. So that would not be considered a point deduction if they're if they do fall below the horizontal. And that's showing the horizontal. So if there's a lot more petals that can the petals could drop below that. Uh, this is a turn back pedal. Um, this is also from the judge's manual. You can see the, the pedal itself is curled in. Uh, it's not unfurling evenly. It's turned back on itself. So that distracts you when you're looking at the form. It's making the form non-symmetrical. So that would be a deduction. Uh, this one is showing a confused center. Um, basically, you're seeing two points inside there. Um, it's opening in two different on two different spots. 
And here's a, an actual, this is distant drums. Um, you can see there, it looks like it's trying to have three or four or five different centers to it. So that's what the illustration showing you. It's a little easier to see on an actual photo. And this is double delight with basically a double center, maybe a triple center. And this one's not really double or triple. This is, but it is confused. You don't have an actual uh, pinpoint center in the middle of it. It's just kind of confused. Uh, when they're talking about a bull nose or a bald center, this is what they're talking about. The uh, a lot of times the rows can have a nice pinpoint center as it's opening and all of a sudden a couple petals open up and you'll see these petals inside folded over like this. So at this point there is no center to the rows. Uh, this is another one, this is Beverly showing a, also a bull nose center. Uh, fewer petal varieties. Um, they don't have as many petals, so if they opened all the way up, like the heavier petaled ones were, their center is gonna be gone. So they're considered, their most beautiful stage is one third to one half open. Um, so those outer petals may not extend down to the horizontal, they, they will be up some from the horizontal because once the petals drop to that point, the center will be gone on the rows. So here's an illustration from the judge's manual showing a, a lighter petal one. This, you know, this variety may have the 17 to 25 petals, so it doesn't have enough to let it fully open and give you that full thing without it losing its center. Uh, cooling and other petal formations. Um, when roses cool, their petals tend to reflex so that they don't have a nice round circular outline. Um, they will come to points that looks almost like a star. But that form should not be penalized. That's the if that's the actual form of the rose itself. Um, there are a lot of varieties that, that naturally do that. But what you want when you have a cold rose is those points on the rose should reach the uh, circular outline, an imaginary circular outline. You won't actually see it like some of the other nice round shaped roses, but the points should all be equal distance from the center. And actually you should be able to imagine a circular outline uh, connecting all the points on the rows. Uh, this is Amber Star. Um, this is a rose that normally quills glowing amber or Ingrid or some of the other roses I have that typically do that. Um, but you can see on the photo, the points are all going out and they're touching that circular outline. So you have to imagine that when you're judging that type of roses. We had actually joked about it a couple of years back, talking about a quilling bias because it seemed like some really exceptional roses weren't making it up to the court because they have the quilled form. And we kind of wonder whether some of the judges maybe didn't get the concept of the quilling or just didn't like it. So they kind of ignored the roses. Um, this is an open bloom also of Amber Star. Um, you can see this one, the outline's a lot more apparent, the more petals that are open and the more points you have, it's easier to, to see that. Um, when there's less, it's a little more difficult to, I guess, imagine that reaching a circular outline. Uh, typical form deductions uh, are non-circular outline. Um, either the, the points of a quill rose don't reach it. Sometimes you'll have a flat spot. Um, one of the outer petals has curled under. Um, you'll have a flat spot on one side, so the petals don't reach the outline. Um, sometimes the bloom itself is misshapen, um, so you'll get kind of an odd shape to it, doesn't have that outline, uh, which would be a deduction. Uh, next one is centers opened up. So you have a hole in the middle of the bloom. 
or it's opened up enough where you see the bull nose or the bald center inside. Uh, confused or double center is another deduction. Uh, the petal opening is non symmetrical. Sometimes it seems you'll see roses where it's, it seems like there's a lot more petals on one side of the bloom as it's unfurling than the opposite. Uh, another one is a void in the unfurling of the petals. Um, some of the lighter petal varieties. Sometimes when you look at those, you'll see it seems like there's a big space on one side where there's no petal, where there should be another petal there, but there's not. Uh, also a recurve petal, a petal is bent back on itself as it's unfurling, it's uh, bent and has a crease in it. Usually it's folded back tight. Or a torn petal, which affects the symmetry of the bloom. Um, as it's opening, sometimes the petal will tear or if someone's trying to open it up, and isn't gentle or the petal stuck, uh, sometimes it will tear. Color as one of the other things we judge on, um, should be clear, bright, clean. Typical of variety, um, refrigeration can alter the color, sometimes weather, uh, it's real hot weather can bleach out the color. Um, Um, a lot of times reds, if you refrigerate them, will tend to blue. Um, you'll see that they get a lavender color to them. Um, look like they've lost color, they're not as bright. Uh, typical color of a variety may also vary with geographical location. Um, a lot of times when we judge other districts or we go to a national show, um, we can see really different color on some of the varieties we're used to judging. Um, and you kind of almost wonder sometimes if that's the right rose. Well, before you deduct anything from it, um, talk to the other judges. Um, check with someone from that area that may be clerking or is involved with the show. Um, see if that's typical of the variety, because there are a lot of a lot of different varieties in color around the country, and depending on what your weather is. I know one of the national shows I went to, they had St. Patrick, and there was probably 25 or 30 blooms years ago when I went, and half of them had that greenish tint to them, and the other half kind of had that peachy color. Um, so they were from different areas, different weather. So the you know, the the color was really apparent difference, but it's just where they were grown. So don't be too quick on pointing down roses, unless you check with someone if the color is different from what you're, you know. Um, another thing with color, a lot of uh, guard petals have either a white or a green streak to them. And even though that's typical of variety, it's a penalty for the color. So you do mark down for that. Um, sometimes it will extend into more than just some of the reds. Sometimes it will go past the guard petal and um, you'll see more of the outer petals with that white streak to them. But it is a deduction. Um, varieties that typically produce petals having blushes or shadings should be penalized if the characteristics aren't present. Um, sometimes when roses are covered or shaded, they don't always get the color that they normally would. Um, and also you want, if it's if the shaded rose, you also want a nice even uh, variation as it goes out. You want a gradual transition of color from the middle to the outer petals. Uh, typical color deductions, loss of substance will lead to a color change. Um, Muddying of the color or bluing of the color due to refrigeration is a typical deduction. Uh, bleaching effects from the intense sun. Uh, damage or spotting, whether it's from fungi, dirt, insect damage, or spray residue, is also a, is considered a color deduction. Uh, blotchy colors on the petal sometimes, for whatever reason, weather, whatever, the color is not even when it should be, and you'll get a strange kind of a look. That is also a color deduction. And the green or white stripes on the petals, typically the guard petals is also a deduction. 
uh, substance is the amount of moisture and starch in the petals. Um, when you when you cut a rose fresh and bring it in from the garden, it always has that nice kind of glow to it. Um, doesn't have that dull kind of look to it after it sits around for a couple days. So when we're judging, we want nice fresh substance to the bloom. Um, Sometimes if the bloom's not taking the water up, you see it start to lose its substance. At first, it's kind of just a dullness to the bloom. Um, the petals just don't look like they have good color. And then you'll start to see it kind of get a little limp and start to wilt. And that's the extreme loss of substance. Uh, also, not only just the bloom, but also sometimes the foliage can appear wilted or droopy. Um, and that's also considered a loss of substance. Uh, typical substance deductions, a lack of brightness to the bloom or dulling in the color, um, indicating a lack of substance. Uh, severe lack of substance will actually cause the bloom to start to wilt. And droopy or wilting foliage is another deduction for substance. Uh, stem and foliage. Uh, stem should be straight with intact prickles, should support the bloom and foliage. Foliage must be clean, healthy, free from insect damage, fungus infection, dirt, pesticide spray residue should frame the bloom. Um, the absence or presence of two or more five leaflet, um, Bruce had talked about earlier, um, used to be in there as a requirement. Now that we have balance and proportion, it's no longer relevant. So that should not be part of your judging um, when you're judging a specimen. Um, when they talk about the foliage framing the bloom, what they mean is when you look down on the bloom from the top, um, the foliage should frame the outside of the bloom. Um, some varieties don't do that. There's some varieties kind of have a like a side by side, almost like a ladder type um, foliage. So they don't always fully frame it. Um, certain varieties always frame it beautifully. So um, you may see both of them uh, depending on the type of bloom you're looking at. But ideally, the best specimens are considered the ones that the folds uh, completely frames the outside of it. Uh, <laughs> this is pretty interesting. Judge should refrain from being so impressed with the foliage and bloom that it, the bloom escapes a thorough evaluation. Um, I've, I've heard some people say, oh my God, look at that foliage is gorgeous. Well, the bloom itself is 70 points in the judging and the uh, Stem and foliage is only 20% of the, the score, so um, you don't want to get so wowed by this beautiful, shiny foliage and nice, big, straight stem that you don't uh, pay attention to the bloom because 70% of your scoring is going to be in that bloom. Now, this was another new uh, addition I had seen that I wasn't aware of. Um, the stem and foliage, the semicircular half moon cuts made in the foliage by leaf cutter bees are not false and should not be penalized. Um, it used to be when I started, any type of insect damage or damage to the thing was considered a deduction. Um, but now, with a lot of people not spraying, and I guess I was trying to help protect pollinators. Um, they decided that the damage from leaf cutter bees should not be considered a deduction. So people aren't out spraying and killing them to, um, to try to avoid that damage. Um, below that, the uh, like I had talked about, there are varieties whose growth habit produces a crooked or a stair step stems. Um, Tiffany Lynn, a disto, or a couple that I can think of offhand. Uh, stem kind of goes one way and then bends back and then bends back. So even though that's typical, the variety, 
is still considered somewhat of a fault and subject to penalization. Um, it is typical of variety and that's what they do. But if you have another specimen with a straighter stem and it comes down that they're just about equal, then um, you would award it to the one with the straighter stem. Um, Prickles removed from the stem above the vase of the rose will incur a penalty. Um, it was interesting when I first started, I had some, one of the exhibitors had removed all the, the prickles from his specimens and I looked and I kind of scratched my head and I thought, well, that doesn't kind of seem right. Like, it, you know, you could see all the, where the, they were removed. And uh, it is a deduction, so you're not allowed to remove them without penalty. Talks again about the uh, five or more leaflets no longer is appropriate, shouldn't be considered. And once again, the foliage should frame the bloom looking down on it. You want a nice the green outline as you're looking on the bloom so it's framed nicely to set off the bloom itself. Uh, typical deductions for stem and foliage, uh, a bent stem, um, a lot of times a rose will grow up from the bottom and kind of bend its way up. Um, when you're looking for a queen of show, you don't want a bent stem. You don't want something that's nodding and looking over at you. Um, so that's a deduction. Um, dirty, torn, or missing foliage is another deduction. Uh, virus or fungus damaged foliage. Lactis budding scars from removing side buds or stems. Um, if you do it too late, um, they have a chance to form. Uh, you'll look down in the leaf axis and you can, a lot of times you'll see a very black uh, scar from where the stuff was removed. A lot of times exhibitors will try to wait and remove it at the end, uh, right before they enter it. Then you, a lot of times you also have you'll have a, a lighter scar you'll see you know lighter color and if you don't notice it don't worry about it. but if it's distracting um, and it's pulling your eye away from the bloom then that's considered a deduction uh, stem on stem above the vase lip if it is distracting if there's a stem on stem you really don't notice it um, you do not have to deduct points for it. Um, if you have two equal specimens, one is stem on stem and one isn't, then the one that isn't would get the preference. Uh, remove prickles above the vase lip. An extremely thick or thin stem is also considered distracting. Um, if you have an extremely stem, it's probably not going to support the bloom above it. So um, you have a nodding bloom. That's also considered deduction. The stem's not strong enough to support it. Uh, some varieties have extremely long peduncles is the area below the bloom down to the first set of leaves. Um, usually it's typical of the variety, but sometimes it looks really, really distracting when you have a bloom and then you don't have any uh, leaves below it for three, four, five inches. So. Um, if it's way, way too long and it's distracting because you're not seeing foliage there, um, that can be a de point deduction. And the last one is foliage doesn't frame the bloom when you when you view it from above. Um, here's black spot on a thing. Um, in our area, quite a while ago, um, in our judging schools, we had talked about not worrying so much about black spot um, unless there's a lot and it's really distracting if you've got a couple spots on the leaf and the leaves still green i kind of almost ignore it anymore unless there's a lot of it if there's just a few spots and it's um, it's not distracting as you're viewing the specimen i don't worry too much about it now if the leaves start turning yellow and you have the black spots and it's severe then then of course that would be a deduction. But um, as I said, with the you know 
the other things about the, the leaf cutter bees. Um, a lot of people don't want to spray anymore. Um, so if we want people that don't spray to exhibit in the shows and share the roses with the public, we want to kind of be a little more lenient. Um, when I was apprenticing, some of the judges talked about when they started, and if there was a black spot on a leave, then it couldn't be awarded any prize because it showed it didn't show good garden hygiene, and judges were just that dead set against it. But like I said, as I started judging, they were kind of getting away from that, and and now we've kind of gone almost totally away from it. If you, you have equal specimen, one has black spot, of course, the one without would, would be the better, but um, I said, I don't worry too much anymore if I see a little black spot. Now, this is interesting. I just cut this one this morning in my garden and uh, you can see the damage on the foliage and there's obvious leaf cutter be, uh, things at the, at the bottom of the picture, there's petals uh, to the left. You can see there's signs of leaf cutter bees. And even on that uh, one to the top right, uh, there's leaf cutter bee damage there, but it also looks like there may be rose slug or some other um, damage with the holes in the center. So I guess in a case like this, I guess you could take deductions off for the holes in the center and just ignore the leaf cutter damage. Um, and if it's mud, this is kind of severe on this this uh, terminal petal here, but um, a lot of times you're looking at specimen, unless you're looking for it, you may not even notice some of the damage. So um, once again, it's the degree of distraction that it's, it's bothering you as to how much you want to deduct for it. A uh, specimen here um, at the bottom, you can see on the left side, uh, there's a couple sets of missing um, leaves. So as you're judging it, um, it's kind of noticeable that they're missing. So you would want to you know, deduct for that. Now the exhibitor could also have removed some of the leaves and pushed the specimen down more, but um, this is something typical you'll see. Um, sometimes if you are missing a leaf, you can trim the other ones and uh, make it not so noticeable, or you can move the specimen down, have a little bit shorter stem and, and do away with it. But if the thing's exhibited like this and you can see that there's obviously leaves missing, then, then you would deduct for that. Uh, balance and proportion. Um, you want the bloom and the stem to produce an aesthetically pleasing exhibit. Um, stem length is critically important in this. Shouldn't be too long or too short. Um, one rule of thumb I was taught right away was um, approximately the stem should be approximately six times the length of a bloom, um, both for minis, mini floras, and large roses. Um, rule of thumb was kind of for minis or mini floras, maybe you know, a dollar bill for the size of the length, and then the bigger ones you would have to figure out depending on the size of the bloom. If you have a huge bloom, you're going to need a longer stem. Um, a smaller bloom would not require as much stem. And as you start judging, you can kind of look and kind of get the feel for it as to what they are. So basically your tip, you know, your balance and deduction deductions are either the stem is too long or the stem is too short for the bloom size. Uh, there's some examples here. Um, you can see the rose on the on the left. The stem is only maybe three times the height of what the bloom, so that's too short. Uh, the one in the center is not a real big bloom, so the stem on that 
is probably a little too long. And then the bloom on the right is a bigger bloom on an even longer stem. So basically the, the proportion for the two on the right is, is kind of similar. Um, so when you judge, it's gonna be something you're gonna to have to kind of figure out and see which one looks more pleasing to you. Um, you can't change them, that's the way they're exhibited. The exhibitor could have changed it, but it's a decision you're gonna to have to make. Now here's the same two blooms, but the larger bloom was pushed down in the vase and it's almost giving you that ideal six times the stem for the bloom where the smaller bloom is still on the longer stem. So looking at the two of those, you can see the exhibit on the left is kind of pleasing. It looks like the stem and foliage matches the bloom and the one on the right, that stem is still too long for that you know, small bloom on the top of it. Uh, size refers to the dimension of the bloom. Um, judge should be familiar with the average size for the variety. Um, there may be times when you don't know what that variety you haven't grown and haven't seen it. Um, so if you think something looks way too big or too small, consult with other judges on your team. If they're not familiar, you may want to grab another team, see if um, anyone's familiar with that, that bloom, that variety, and see whether um, it's the common size or whether it's way too small or way too big for that. Um, but usually uh, a bloom is larger than usual. It's rewarded for points, uh, good growing practices. And if a bloom is undersized, it should be penalized. Um, you have a tiny bloom that, that's not considered typical for the area, then that that's considered a, a penalty. Uh, considering all other factors are equal, the larger bloom would prevail over the smaller bloom of the same variety. And also size can be the determining factor for winning rows. However, size alone shouldn't sway the judge into report, ignoring the other aspects of judging the rows. Um, if you have a huge bloom and there's issues with the bloom and you've got a slightly smaller bloom that's perfect, um, you want to point score it accordingly. Um, the large rows may get a more, few more points for size, but if it's losing points in all the other areas, and a little bit smaller variety is, or a little smaller specimen is not, then you would want to pick the smaller one if it's um, point scoring higher than the large ones. So typical size deduction is um, the bloom is smaller than typical the variety for the area. Um, here's some actual blooms that you'll see when you're judging. Um, this was from the Del Chester show in 2016. It was Sunny Sundays with the Queen. It was exhibited by Ken Borman. Um, this is kind of a tight bloom. Normally in our area, if they're not really shown this tight, um, they're usually open a little more. Uh, this is from another Del Chester show. It was Marlin's Day. Um, just a gorgeous hybrid tea bloom. Um, you can see the petals fully open, laid back, um, perfect center. Um, it's unswirling nice and evenly, uh, nice color. Uh, this was Ring of Fire. Um, it's one of Tom Mayu's photos. I don't know that this was entered in a show. It may have just been taken in his garden, but you can see um, it's displaying all the characteristics that you want in a perfect hybrid tea bloom. Um, got the good center, sun swirling evenly, petals are out to the horizontal. A very nice specimen. Another one of Tom's is uh, Gemini. 
another gorgeous hybrid tea bloom, but you can kind of see as you look through the different varieties, the different types of form and what you'll have to judge against in a show against each other. Um, they all have their own um, characteristics. So you'll have to compare one to the other and decide which, which you like better or which you point more. Uh, there's another one of Tom's pictures, Moonstone. Another beautiful exhibition bloom. Uh, this was another one from his garden he had posted, um, Randy Scott. And uh, one of the things I had talked about, you can kind of see in this photo down at the uh, like the six o'clock, seven o'clock area, um, it kind of looks like they're that petal that's tight should have been opened up more if he was exhibiting it. Uh, would have probably pulled that petal down to kind of fill that void. When I talk about voids in the uh, you know the the bloom unfurling symmetrically, um, whether the petal's just stuck or it hasn't released yet. Um, but that's one of the things when you're judging really good specimens against each other, you kind of have to nitpick sometimes, and um, that's one of the things you may look for. Uh, it's a good shot of Maverick, also by Tom, um, showing the triangular form from the side. Uh, the petals are out, being out even to the horizontal. Uh, Veterans Honor, um, a lot of you have seen this. This was his photo from a uh, cover photo from the ARS uh, calendar one year. Um, showing perfect, you know, exhibition form on Veterans Honor. Uh, the next bunch were um, interesting to see. This was uh, the Court of Honor from 2014, Philadelphia. Uh, this was our specimen. This was the Duchess. And as you go, as we go through up to the Queen, you can kind of see the difference and and why the rose is got what they got. Um, this here kind of on the right, the petal is not quite down far enough. It's kind of up, so the bloom's not really symmetrical. Uh, still had a really nice center. It's a nice clean bloom, um, but it's not quite as good as what it could have been. Uh, this is Gemini. This was also ours was the Prince. Um, you can kind of see, it, even though it's not straight on, um, it kind of has the point at the top and the bottom, and the uh, the petal on the far side is not quite down as much, so you don't really get a really good um, kind of circular outline to it. And this was uh, the princess. This was Tom's cardinal. Um, I think it was kind of a little bit smaller bloom, but really nice hybrid tea form to it. Um, it's unswirling nice, but it wasn't, I don't think it was quite as large as the other, which is typical of Cardinal. Cardinal is not usually a really large hybrid tea, but a really nice specimen. Uh, this was the King. This was Cherry Parfait. It was also ours. Um, beautiful color, nice center. Um, opened up really well, but you can kind of see how it's looking at you. It's kind of facing you. So the stem, it did have a bent stem. It wasn't sitting upright. Um, had it been a more, you know, more upright straight stem, uh, there's a chance that maybe that would have been the queen, but uh, really nice bloom, but with the stem, it didn't, didn't quite make it. And this was the actual queen. This was a signature also ours. Um, see, opened up perfectly, uh, nice color, nice swirling. So as you kind of go through the progression, you can kind of see how the judges ranked, and I thought they did a really good job ranking those um, from the same show. Now you're not <laughs> you're not always going to get the perfect hybrid tees to judge. Um, you're going to get new people. You're going to get some people that you know aren't into exhibiting as much, and you'll be encountering specimens like this. Um, this was out of our garden this morning. Uh, it's Frederick Mistral. Um, it's got a really nice center to it. Um, 
nice color, but it looks like it's got some botrytis problems, some some weathering problems from the the rain the other day. Um, not quite opened up. Um, pedal at the seven eight o'clock position. Um, should be down a little more to kind of give you that circular outline. So uh, this is the kind of thing you're going to encounter. So you have to decide kind of how you're going to point score this, what you're going to take off. Um, so this is not going to be a blue ribbon. Um, for me, it would probably end up being a really low second or maybe a high third. Um, it's a decision you have to make with the other judges. This is wedding bells. Um, this is a very healthy rose, but it has really kind of strange form. It doesn't really always, really never has that high center hybrid T form. It's always kind of a, kind of rounded, almost kind of bald shape uh, bloom to it. So that's something else as you're judging, you're going to encounter stuff like this. Um, you know, it really doesn't have that center. You know, it's got a few other issues with, with Mark. So, you know, for me, I would probably end up probably give this a probably a third, maybe a very low second. It hasn't lost the center, but the form's kind of funny and it has some other problems. This is also another wedding bells, and here's the issue where a rose is not open enough. Um, it's got petals that are kind of pulling down almost to the horizontal, but it's just starting to open. Um, petals are just starting to open. This is a very heavy petal row, so it's probably got 55, 60, 70 petals to it. So it, it's got to be open a lot more. Um, so someone in like something like this, you know, it's really just kind of past bud stage. Um, you can't give it too many points because it's not open. So this would probably end up being an, an honorable mention in the show for me. Uh, judging single hybrid teas in Grand Flores, um, single is a rose having four to eight petals. Um, don't consider single should be confused with one bloom per stem. Single is the actual petal count. Um, you don't find a lot of these in the show. Um, normally, if you do have one entered, it's usually Danny Bess. Sometimes you'll see a Mrs. Oakley Fisher, or Irish Fire Flame, or one or two other ones. So you don't see a lot. Um, but you, when you judge them, you want to have that nice circular outline. You want them to be clean. You want the petals to be open, um, just as you would a single miniature or or a bundle or whatever other type of rose you're judging. Um, it also says show schedule may allow a single hybrid tea to be exhibited as an individual or as a spray. Um, some shows will have a class for each. Sometimes the class will say bloom or spray. So you have to read the show schedule to see what they want. So. Uh, this is a specimen of Danny Bess, typically what you'll see in the show. Um, you want the petals open almost to the flat, nice fresh stamens, um, good color. You want the petals to be symmetrical. You don't want to have a small petal or petal that's bent or dropped out. So you're looking for the nice circular outline, nice and fresh, good color. Judging Decker to form hybrid teas in Grandiflora. Um, Show schedule may allow single hybrid tea. The exhibit is an individual bloom or spray. Um, sometimes they may group them together. Um, not all hybrid teas in Grand Floors present exhibition form that they can express the beauty of their own. When I first started exhibiting, I used to grow East Piaget. Uh, was a decorative hybrid tea. I took it to a show and someone's like, you can't put that in with the hybrid teas. That's not a hybrid tea. And 
Nancy Redding to come over. Oh yeah, it's a hybrid tea. She said it doesn't have the form, but it's a decorative hybrid tea. They go in with the hybrid teas and they can get a blue ribbon, but they're not gonna make the court of honor. Um, so that's kind of changed a little bit. Um, the new rules say, although an exhibition form will win over a decorative form, the judge must not pass it in a decorative rose without consideration. Ribbons, including blue ribbons, are certainly appropriate for decorative roses to present at their most pleasing aspect. The fact that hybrid tea is normally decorative should not prevent a superior specimen from reaching the hybrid tea or grand floor court of honor. So basically what that's telling me is they prefer it to be an exhibition bloom for the court of honor, but if it's an exceptional decorative hybrid tea, it can make the court of honor. And sometimes depending on the show, you may not have a lot of really good exhibition type hybrid teas to fill your court. And if you have decorative hybrid teas, um, they can help fill the court out. So you end up having a full court and not you know, two or three rows of sitting up there. Uh, these are some of the decorative form um, hybrid teas you'll encounter. Uh, Savannah, very fragrant. Um, love this rose. I haven't really exhibited much as, as a hybrid tea. Um, usually I put it in a fragrance class and it's done quite well there. But if I have some specimens, I may enter them in hybrid tea classes and see whether one of them can make it up to the, to the court one day. Uh, State of Grace is a grand floor. It's kind of got that open kind of cupped form to it. Uh, all dressed up as another uh, newer week's rose has that decorative form. Um, when you're judging these, there you don't have your typical hybrid tea form, um, but you're still going to look for that circular outline. Um, you know all the other aspects you're judging for. Um, you would like it to be, even though it's informal, you would like it to be somewhat symmetrical. Um, sometimes you look at the bloom and it looks like there may be a lot more petals to one side than the other, so that you may not consider. Um, but you're kind of looking for similar stuff, even though it doesn't have that high center like the hybrid tea does. Uh, Mula Romanica seems to be a popular one around here. A lot of people grow it as that cupped form to it. Uh, Sweet Mademoiselle is another one that um, has grown quite a bit around here. Beautiful rose. Um, but once again, has a decorative form. Uh, Princess Charlene de Monaco, another hybrid tea with the decorative form. So there are quite a few of them out there and it seems to be more and more of them are being released. So um, you're gonna encounter more of them. So just be aware if you get a really good one, um, it can go up for the court of honor. Uh, judging climbing hybrid teas and grand floors, um, they are not entered in the, in the climber class. They must be exhibited in the hybrid tea and grand floor classes. Uh, years ago, I used to grow climbing first prize. Um, used to give some incredibly large flowers. First prize gives large roses anyway, but. Um, the climbing version would really give me some almost seven, eight inches across. So some really, really large roses, but they must be entered in the hybrid to your grand or floor class. Um, they don't belong with the climbers. And varieties classes climbing, climbing hybrid to your grand or floor that do not have a non climbing counterpart. Um, offhand, I used to grow Aloha it was a climbing hybrid tea and there was no non climbing Aloha. Um, so that would still be exhibited with the hybrid teas. Okay, judging hybrid tea and grand floor open blooms. Um, basically, when you're judging those, you're looking for a nice circular outline. You want nice fresh stamens. Um, 
you also want the blooms to be, you know, the way the petals inside, you want them to be symmetrical and not heavy to one side or the other. Um, you want a nice even opening. So you were saying the symmetry of the petals, you want the circular outline. Um, petaloids, so they may enhance or distract from the beauty specimen. Um, you're free to, exhibitors free to remove them but you don't want to leave part of them. So, um, some people, they may bother more than others. Um, it's not affecting, it's not real distracting, then um, you don't really want to point down if it's not really distracting from it. A lot of exhibitors will try to remove them just to give it a nicer, cleaner appearance. But it's not something you need to, to worry about if it's not distracting for you as a judge. And so many, many petals do not lie on a horizontal plane. Um, you want it open sometimes. Um, exhibitor, if a rose loses its center, exhibitor may try to pluck out the center of it because it's not going to be an exhibition bloom. So they'll pluck it out. Um, and some, you know, they, they may introduce an open bloom, kind of looking almost like a tulip. But um, when you're judging and picking an open bloom, even though the stamens might be nice and fresh on that, you want something that's laid out more on the horizontal plane um, where the stamens are still fresh other than something that just looked like somebody pulled the, uh, the, 10 or 15 inner petals out and, you know, just stuck it in that way. Um, here's an example of a, a Melody Parfumé, an open bloom. Um, beautiful specimen, but you can see up at top, like the 11 o'clock, the petal that's kind of folded in would be a distraction. So even though it may be a blue, if there was another one that didn't have that, um, like this next one, uh, Mr. Lincoln, um, nice and even, open, unfurled, um, nothing distracting. So that would end up being picked over the other because you don't have that petal kind of curled over and distracting from it. And if you're not sure what petaloids are, this is a, uh, a double delight. And you can see in here down at the, uh, the six o'clock, um, it's just a small immature petal that hasn't opened all the way or it's, it's not going to form a full petal. Um, and there's also one up at the, the one o'clock position that's kind of folded behind. Um, usually the exhibitors want to remove those so they're not in there and distracting, but that is uh, one of the things you might deduct points for if you're, you're looking at an open bloom. That and also the you know your typical your color and substance and whether it has that circular outline are the things you would judge for. Uh, awards for hybrid teas and grand floors um, they're eligible for king queen and princess. Um, where you have the ARS the gold silver and bronze certificates. Um, Court of Honor, sometimes uh, some societies will pick just the top three, other ones may have four, some may have five, some may extend it out even farther than that. Um, there's no real certain number for Court of Honor, it depends what the local society wants to decide on. Um, also, um, when you're voting for court, blue ribbon winners from the novice, the junior, small garden classes are also eligible. So you may encounter more than one of a, a variety. Um, you could end up if the novice, junior, or small garden all exhibited a double delight and someone had another double delight in the regular classes, you could have four of those up there being judged for court. So don't be confused if you see more than one of one spec, one of more than one of one uh, variety up for court. Um, It also says ARS, no rule prevent more than one being on, um, 
more than one specimen of the same variety can be on the court of honor. So well, theoretically, all four of those could be on the court, plus another, you know, one other. If you had a four to five, they could all be up there. Um, the other certificates available for hybrid teas and granite floors or hybrid tea spray, granite floor spray, um, large rose single bloom. Um, that's picked from any large rows. They're, they're awarding that for the show. Um, the queen of show could also, I guess, get that uh, award too. And then large, large rows open bloom um, used to be hybrid tea open bloom. It's been changed. So societies could include other types of roses besides hybrid tea. Um, climbers, old garden roses, floor bundas. Uh, could all be eligible for that now. Same, the same thing for the open bloom. Um, best open bloom certificate can go to any large rose. Um, whose exhibition stage is not fully open. Um, so it would have to be a rose that has a different type of form other than an open form to be eligible for it. And there's also awards for, I guess, the junior and you know local society awards for the other ones. So that is it for my presentation. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, we will start with our questions. Uh, if you do have any questions, I ask that you raise your hand and I will call upon you so far. Uh, we have a few questions already up and I will start with the first, which is Darlene Lowell. Darlene, you're now unmuted. If you'll unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Darlene, are you there? Right. Yes, you're still self-muted. If I'll come back to you, keep your hand raised. You still want to ask that question? And I'm going to Miss Billy Flynn. Billy, ask your uh, question. Yeah. Okay. I would like to suggest that uh, the authors of Rose Show schedules include the class for decorative hybrid tea and write out an explanation of what that means so that even the judge knows. It is in the handbook, the explanation, that it's it's one bloom at exhibition form for that variety and only hybrid teas or grandifloras which do not typically produce a high pointed symmetrical center but rather typically display an informal flat or cupped center or eligible for this award. In other words, you, you can't put in a, a, a veteran's honor just because it didn't open up right and put it in that category. It has to be like uh, wedding bells that doesn't typically have the, the exhibition form or Savannah, those roses. And that makes a beautiful display on the table and they are they get a trophy they don't get their king and queen and they don't go uh they're not um in competition with the exhibition form they're just a separate form just like the open bloom or the spray is a separate form well that's a that's a separate class so that's my suggestion Thank you, Billy. And this is Diane Summers. That is a great lead in to uh, our discussion from last week, isn't it? The whole concept of um, decorative form versus exhibition form. And um, I have asked Don Myers to join us today. Don is the chair of horticulture judging 
And so there's been a lot of discussion, even after last week's meeting, about this topic. And, um, and so, Don, I would like you to please step in here and discuss the two issues that really um, came up a lot last week that we never really resolved. And one of them is um, the role of the decorative or the place of the decorative rows in our row shows, as well as uh, laterals when we're looking at sprays. So, Don, if you could please chime in here. Hi, Diane. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, thank you. Good, because I've been having a lot of trouble with the phone and the computer. But anyway, um, I agree with the, the speaker, although I will have a couple comments about it, uh, of decorative roses. Still read the description of decorative roses uh, in the current manual. And frankly, I rarely see a decorative type of rose on the head table even though supposedly they're eligible. In almost all cases, a hybrid tea with exhibition form will, will beat a decorative rose. So in my view, we should have a new class for decorative roses that would go on the table. And in addition to that, it would include other roses that could, be, could have decorative form. I don't know if there are any comments on that thought, but uh, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you, Don. This is Diane again. But to be clear, and as Bill read in, in our guidelines, a decorative form can be on the court from hybrid tea perspective, granite floor perspective, right? As well as miniature mini floor. It can be on the court, but do you ever see one? I don't know that I've ever seen one on the court. But is that because of uh, the way we judge versus the fact that we haven't had those great decorative forms. That would be my question and challenge. And I think that's the value of having this group of judges together from all across the country. You know, we, we you know, rarely go back and read word for word our judging guidelines year after year, right? And so this is something that we all need to be aware of at this point. And maybe we'll start to see more decorative forms on the court as we've all been enlightened now to what the guidelines truly tell us. I have seen um, green ice make the miniature court before as a decorative rose, but that's really the only one that I remember ever seeing. We had a show uh, this uh, spring and Traviata was uh, on the court of honor, okay. but that was because they had a special class for Traviata, I mean for uh, decorative roses. It wasn't on the court of honor, it was on the head table. Okay. And I just think we should recognize them. Bill showed a number of nice pictures. Yeah. I have several in my garden, including the, uh, the Princess uh, Charlene de Monaco. Uh, that's a great bush and beautiful blooms. And yet if you entered that in a rose show, I would dare say that probably would not get on the head table because there's no place for it except within the hybrid teas. Now why did they call the Princess Charlene a hybrid tea? I don't know. To me the form looks much more like a shrub but that's not, I didn't make the decision. Somebody who, who created that rose decided it would be a hybrid tea. Yeah it seems the European breeders are focused more on um, from what the guy from court has said as to how the rose grows, not so much the shape of the bloom. When we went to New, New York to the Nationals, he said if it grows long cutting stems, uh, one bloom per stem, they consider it a hybrid tea. If it grows uh, sprays, they consider it a floribunda. So their their focus is basically on how the, the rose itself grows, not on so much the form of it. So he said they really don't consider the form a lot anymore. They, they're they just looking for a good rose that grows well, it's disease resistant, um, something beautiful. And that's, I think, why a lot of them, you know, it's probably the same with Mayon. Um, a lot of those, Princess uh, Charlene is from Mayon. So probably a similar attitude is, you know, what they're classifying them as. They don't want to call them a shrub because in their mind, it's growing like a hybrid tea. So they're not worried about, Rose shows, they're just 
worried about how they're going to sell to the public and if people can buy them as a cut rose you know cut along a bouquet of long stem roses that they consider a hybrid tea yes but uh we're we're worried about rose shows yeah i think billy's uh, suggestion was good you know it's something that we can do without having changes in classifications um, people that run shows can make a class for the decorative hybrid teas and like you did down there same thing um, that way you can have you know you can have one their own class and you can get them up to the you know head table someone has a really good specimen but the point okay, is okay but what about world. what about decorative miniatures such as mariotta which you probably grow yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah i got quite a few decorative minis um so where do they go <laughs> usually i exhibit it as a spray is the only way i get it up there um but you could also do you know same thing for that you could have a decorative mini mini floor class or you could even include them in one big class that would be another way you know to get around it um usually the only time i exhibit it is either maybe in the open class if you could see the stamens on it um spray class sometimes maybe in a box english box or a bowl but it is something to talk about um they want to come up with a class for them but just to be clear for all of our judges right in today's guidelines it does indicate yes. that a decorative form can be on the court yes. for really any classification it's there for hybrid teas and grandifloras it's there for miniatures and it's there for mini floras and so um, the fact is you know people enjoy all different forms of flowers and um, we should make sure that all of those can be enjoyed at the rose show right and and we shouldn't discount them and i think that's the message right now that needs to get out to all of our judges now we can clearly go beyond that and we can look at setting up separate class for them but the but i i really want to make sure that people know that today they can be yep. um, on the court and those are the guidelines and we should judge that way accordingly But do you see any on the court? Again, that might be more a factor of how we judge versus anything else, Don. I think we need to open people's eyes and minds, and um, that's what this seminar is all about for our current judges, right? So I guess sure. we'll wait. We'll wait and see in the next year, and hopefully we'll start to see some on our courts, right? And then we can say yay. <laughs> yeah, something they could stress well, if you're doing a district judging seminar. Um, we can push that point a little bit more, talk about it, let people know that they are. Um, so there, there's quite a few changes from when I started judging, and that's only 20 years ago um, in the new rules. So it's more of changing the way we do, like Diane said, more of a way of changing the way we do judge and being open to different new things. Uh, I'm reading a uh, answer in a in the question pod uh, from Judy Frederick. Uh, it says Marietta has been on the court in the NCNH district. Uh, just mm -hmm. to add in, uh, and I think we have a few more uh, comments in there that have spoke about uh, them being on the court. Now you realize that the single the single rose is also a decorative rose. And yet we've we've developed a uh, special class for singles, and that is often on the head table. So why couldn't we have one for these other decorative roses that aren't singles, but are more like uh, well, as as described in the uh, in the the booklet in the book? Yes. Yeah, so Don, I think that that's something that um, you can explore with your committee. And uh, I would ask that you have Satish join you from the uh, Rose Exhibitor Committee. And um, certainly, you know, we're all for 
again, you know, nothing's ever static. There's always opportunities to change and evolve. But again, right now, decorative forms can be on the court. So today's discussion, um, you know, I don't want to confuse anybody who's taking the exam. <laughs> and I want to make sure that unless there's a change or you write a special class in your show schedule, um, you know, for decorative that maybe, you, you know, you do something with a local certificate, for example, um, I want to make sure that we are all consistent in following the guidelines, right? All right. Uh, I have a few other questions if you would like me to go to those now. Sounds good, John. All right. Uh, the first one I'm going to call on is Mary Fulgham. Mary, I'm unmuting you so that you can ask your question. If you'll unmute yourself. All right, so I had this written down. Since wedding bells that you showed first typically looks like that, wouldn't you judge it as a decorative? Because the way that you couched your remarks, it seemed to me or it sounded to me like you were judging it um, how you would judge a regular hybrid tea. But isn't that a decorative form, Rose? Because it's going to come up here soon with for us. Yeah, it's kind of... Uh kind of one of the ones that's kind of in between it looks at times like it almost wants to have the hybrid t form uh-huh but until it's all the way open um it's not it, it always kind of has that almost full nose look to it um doesn't get the real high center so i guess it would be considered a decorative form but it kind of tricks you at times to almost looking like it has that center um the one that was barely open was the, you know, the, the wedding bells as it starts to it had kind of has that. And then it, you know, it's just. <coughs> I expect kind of to a, encounter this coming up like really soon. <coughs> yeah. It grows well down here. So. Yeah, it know. grows great here. It's, it's loves, it goes through the winter with no problem. It produces a lot of flowers. Um, very carefree. Um, grows like a monster. So I like it in the garden. It's just something that not going to do much for the rose show but i love it in my garden so when you see it on the on, on a show to be judged would you consider it a decorative rose if i ever saw one i've <laughs> i've never seen one actually go to a show um i guess i would have to consider it you know depending how how it's open yeah okay thank you you're welcome Next question is from Helen Moyet. Helen, I'm gonna unmute you and you can oh. ask your question. Go ahead, Helen. Oh, hold on. I'm still in the learning process. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, I had typed it out. I said, my question is about awarding specimens, ribbons, for first to fourth place, which is honorable mention. What I've noticed is very few honorable mentions are awarded. Um, and more check marks have been given out than honorable mentions. And a check mark, I was told, merely means that the judge had looked at the specimen. And I don't understand that concept. Um, if someone takes the time and effort to enter a row show and put the rose in, and no matter the condition, the rose may be in poor condition, but they took that time and they were interested enough in coming. I feel that more honorable mention should be made just for the effort and more education, which means having the judges stay afterwards and talk to the exhibitors and, and find out if the person says, I got an honorable mention, hey, that's great. What does that mean? Or how does this compare to another rose? We as judges can talk to the people and tell them you know, more about their specimen. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in more education at the shows than merely judging what we see and then leaving and then having people maybe wonder why. 
that's it. Thank you. I, <laughs> I'll talk I wholeheartedly you. agree with you. <laughs> I, uh, I always, we always try here. We always try to give as many, you know, ribbon as possible. Um, <clears throat> unless something's really bad or if it's not out of water and dying mm -hmm. and they don't want to give it a rope, we always try to give out as many honorable mentions as possible. Like I agree if you, if they're taking the time and it's usually a newer person, you want to encourage them. Um, I always tend to go easier than harder when I'm judging. Um, as you said, you, know, you want to encourage people and I don't get a lot of chance to judge a lot of shows um, since I'm exhibiting so much. But if I do, I always try to hang around <clears throat> and talk to the exhibitors afterwards. People have questions. Um, you walk around, you got your judges ribbon on, people will grab you and say, you know, can you take a look at this? Or, you know, I put this in and I got this. It's, you know, what can I do better? I. It's nice when the judges can stay around. They, all, you know, a lot of times they can if they're traveling with someone, they have to go. But um, I also encourage the judges to hang around as much as they can and uh, talk to the exhibitors and educate them. Thank you. Am I on? You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay. I, I think all I'm right. now. Okay. Very Next. good point. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, next question is from Bruce Monroe. Bruce, I'm meeting you. I just want to make a couple points. I may have mentioned this before, but when I was national chairman, I asked the district chairs, said you're judging a small row show, and there are only three blue ribbons in the miniature class, one of which is green ice, which is a decorative. <laughs> should you put it on the court of honor? <laughs> or should you just leave it blank and only have two roses on the court of honor? And I think I got about a 50-50 split from those who, <laughs> who answered it. <laughs> Secondly, uh, what, what I learned on the classification committee is that Europeans tend to uh, classify the roses by, uh, as Bill said, and our Don said, by the way they grow. Particularly, if somebody buys the hybrid tea, they know how much space that's going to take. And if they, we would say, okay, that's a shrub. It's got to bloom like a shrub. If they call it a shrub, people won't buy it if they don't have enough space for a, a, a big rose that's going to go all over the place. So we've got to recognize that we're going to get a lot of roses from Europe, with uh, in, which uh, we would classify because we classify by bloom, but they classify as hybrid teas because they classify by the way they grow, the space they take. Now, I'm not going to reclassify on all the shrubs. I don't think that would be a smart thing to do. <laughs> We're going to leave them the way they classified them, but uh, be aware of that fact. And the third thing I, I meant, mentioned, which, which was correct, correctly pointed out, was that if you put in a class for a decorative, you've got to define what you mean by decorative uh, because it, it's it's not apparent and uh, it was uh, was given and uh, the, there was the definition given. So that was that was exactly right. So thanks very much. All right, thank you, Bruce. Next person we have is Edna Robert. Edna, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, um, on the specimen with the leaf cutter bees, which would have been penalized more? leaving the leaf on the right or removing that leaf? That's question one. I don't know, according to the manual, uh, the leaf cutter damage should not be penalized. Um, as an exhibitor, I think I probably would have removed it or trimmed it down. Um, so it didn't look as distracting. Um, knowing that the judges may just consider it a damaged leaf, but um, like I said, I'm, I'm, <laughs> until I was putting my presentation together and going through the, the new manual, I didn't know that they had changed the thing with the leaf cutter bees. But um, from what it says, it doesn't appear like it should be penalized. I don't know <laughs> whether the judges are going to go along with that, but that's what the new manual says. 
Okay, but you said there was some other type of damage on that one leaf. Yeah, there was a couple small holes that looked like maybe a uh, rose slug or something. You know, they were minor, they were small, but the majority of them looked like leaf cutter damage. But um, so that as an exhibitor, I, I would have removed it probably or trimmed it down as a judge. Um, <laughs> I probably would have kind of ignored it. Okay. All right, my other question. In one judging situation, there was a photography class. Would the um, best photography be considered for best of show? It's up to the show. That's what I thought it would be. What we decided was that if it was in a garden, that it was much uh, tougher to get that to um, the show table than a, a photography uh, specimen. I guess it would depend on your show. Um, if it's in the Hort class, you know, for the if the best of show is considered for the Hort class, uh, photography is kind of a separate section as well as arrangements. But there's also been shows um, where the best of show was picked from the arrangements. So it would depend on the specifications, I guess, for your best of show award, um, whether photography and arrangements are consider with it or if it's solely for horticulture. So, uh, so we'd have to consult with the show chair to find out exactly what they want to do with that. Okay, thank you. It's been a very good program. Thank you. All right, we have a uh, question, uh, comment, let's see here, from John Donaldson. John? Unmute yourself and you can ask a question there. We go. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, I got, Hello, I got John. Hey, hey, how are you? Is that Bill just said hi? Yep, how are you doing? Good. You know, it's funny, the, the video is a little behind the voice or something. I, I'm, I'm hearing you say hi, but I'm not seeing your lips move. Um, okay, a, a couple of things. Uh, I'm from Colonial District, by the way. And uh, first thing, we, we want to have a judge's school next spring. And I've been trying to get a hold of Don, but I don't have a phone number. But I sent you a few emails, Don. But uh, can somebody send me an email or, or give me some contact information so that I can talk to somebody at the national level about helping us with a judge's school so we can get the application all done right? I thought I've sent you several emails about that, but if not, uh, I'm happy to help you with it. Okay, who's speaking, please? This is Don. Oh, that's Don. Okay, for some reason, Don, I'm not getting them, and 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 that's why I keep then I keep emailing you back, and <laughs> like I don't get anything. But um, uh, so I'm not sure what's happening. But uh, can I give you a phone number? Sure. Uh, got a pencil? I've got several of them. Uh, all right, 804? Wait a minute. 804, yep. 350? Okay. 6227? Quite often, the uh, Colonial and Carolina have teamed up. You know that because you came to our our uh, judging school, did you not? That's where you became a judge. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that and and any time you know, that's those are the kinds of things I'd want to uh, discuss, um, as well as you know, instructors and and all. But. Um, uh, I'll just wait for your call when you get a chance. Please give me a call and, and hope you're doing fine. Um, Do you have I, a location for it? One final well, location for this? Well, we're going to have it in Richmond if we can, uh, along with our okay. show here. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll call you. Thank you so much. Um, Richmond also uh, has a bit of a quirk about it. Uh, and from what I know from the history, which is a long time ago, 
the, the clubs had some years before it joined the ARS. So we actually have a class in our show called non-exhibition form hybrid tees. And um, it's often empty. And uh, I've been trying to, to find roses to recommend for people to enter in that. But I, I think it was formed uh, because, you know, the exhibition form didn't really get to be super popular until after peace. And um, I'm guessing maybe that's why. But uh, we have a class for singles and then we have a non-exhibition form class. And then we have the, um, you know, the regular class, and which which leads into this, my next question um, for Don and and um, Bruce from the historical perspective. I remember from the manual saying that an exhibition form was eligible uh, for Queen, or I mean, a decorative form was eligible for Queen, but only if it. Uh, had a, on a rare occasion it had exhibition form. Um, and when Bill, Bill's mentioning green ice on the mini court, I think that was at the, the Penn Jersey show in Gettysburg one year. And I was a judge up there and, and it was quite a stir. You know, pe people, when we talked about it afterwards, I, I voted to put it on the court and others didn't think it should have been on, you know. Um, but is that what the rule still says that the rose is eligible, but only if it's it has ex exhibition form or is or is it should should it be judged as a decorative rose without exhibition form? Uh, the so current rules say that current rules say decorative form is eligible. Um, exhibition form is preferable over decorative form. But an exceptional decorative specimen should not be ignored for a court of honor. It's the way it's worded now. They're kind of telling you that they prefer exhibition, but if it's an exceptional decorative, then it is eligible for the court. So kind okay. of a little mixed if, message. If it's eligible for the court, it's also eligible for the queen. I don't know how you could say yes. it's not eligible for the queen. All right. And it doesn't have <laughs> any sort of it it, it can be it's, it's normal what what's typical for the variety it can be in that form yes okay um and then the fourth yeah, that's, thing that's the way I read now uh, we've judged in denver before marion and i and um rocky mountain district is has a lot of leaf cutter exhibits i guess that that's a very active insect out there and um that they they were very strict in telling us not to take off for that damage. Um, the way I would recommend uh, judging it and and also exhibiting it is not to remove the the leaf because in my mind it affects the balance. And yeah. and and if there's a you know if if there's something there you can kind of imagine what the leaf would look like filled in, but if the leaf is gone then then the, it might throw the balance off. Um, that, that's my comment. Uh, well, I thanks, I thanks for, I'm sorry I took so much time, but, and Don, uh, look forward to talking to you. And thank you, One Bill. comment that I have that uh, I think is important is that judges should read the new manual and not wait till there's a problem. Because there were a lot of changes in that manual. There was a lot of effort put into that, and many, many changes have been made. So I think judges need to, need to be very much aware of them before they judge a show and not have to wait until, well, we have this, we have old thoughts on this, and we shouldn't do that, and we shouldn't do that. You should rely on the manual as your guide. All right. Well, well thank you, Don, and we will be sure and uh... – Shut up. Remind and notify all our colonial district judges to um, uh, download and read the new manual. Thank you. You're most welcome. That's the easy thing now. It is available as a download, so you can go right to the ARS site and download it and have the latest version. You don't have to send away for it anymore. So very easy to do. 
All right. I have one question here. This is for uh, Don. Don, uh, they were wondering if you were going to be able to discuss laterals from dis discussion from last week. Yes, we should discuss that comment. What was the specific question? Uh, it wasn't it just, clear to me from what it, I read it, in the email. I, I, that I don't know right here and here. Uh, Diane, do you happen to remember? Sorry, I was having trouble with my mute button. I mean, basically, uh, the the discussion last week was whether or not you had to remove the lateral or if it was acceptable to be considered as part of a spray. Some people would think it should not have been included in the spray. Others thought it was acceptable given the current guidelines. Okay, I think it's acceptable. However, if the, the lateral interferes with the blooms somehow, then it should be removed. All right. I don't see any rule that says you can't take off a stem, can't remove a stem. The question was more about leaving them on, yeah. That some people thought that you could, that they had to be removed. No, they don't. However, it also depends on the variety and the class in which it's being entered. For example, the rose they were talking about, wasn't it Harrison's yellow? It was. Yeah, that's correct. That was the example from the presentation. Yes, yeah, so I also have a comment from Mike Eckley here in the chat. Lateral blooms, what is the determination? We have lots of laterals in our shows, uh, the front range, in the front range. Right. Any other comments on that or do I need to move on to the next question? So maybe that'd be something good for us to also follow up with Don and maybe, um, you know, we can see we've got a couple of, of hot buttons here that maybe need clarification. Maybe it's, you know, further discussion. Um, but I think what Don was saying is that in the current guidelines, there is nothing that would require you to remove laterals, as Don said. If it's uh, distracting, if it's impacting the blooms, then clearly um, that would need to be removed. Um, and maybe in the in this example, maybe we look at, you know, be informative to get a number of different photos of different laterals that we're all talking about. Because I think it was the Harrison yellow picture, right? That just created a lot of questions. So let's maybe get a few different pictures uh, together. And uh, I think that'd be a great follow-up to say, how would they be judged? All right. We'll move on to the next question, which is from uh, Lessa Lane. Uh, let me unmute you. I hope I said your name right. Or Lisa. Go ahead. We see that you're unmuted. All right, we can't hear you. You're back muted again. Let's go ahead, try one more time. All right, you're green, so we should be able to hear you, but we don't. All right, we're gonna move to Edward Cunningham. We'll try to go back to you in just a second. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I found the picture of uh, Harrison's yellow that, uh, you know, led to this discussion. And looking at it, uh, you know, I have the picture in front of me. I don't know if you people have it available to be seen or not. It looks like a cane that's going straight up. And then there's a bunch of laterals that go off on different sides off this cane. 
uh, it does not look anything like a spray as it's uh, supposed to be like uh, close knit, uniform, symmetrical. Uh, it's uh, more like a, a burst of fireworks or something all going off in different directions. Um, it, it just makes me think of, uh, if you had any rose that ha has long canes, has a bunch of different laterals at different points along the cane that come off with a flower and say, oh, that cane is a spray. It uh, just does not seem to meet any of the criteria of a spray when, as I'm looking at the picture. And the discussion that we had last week uh, was more uh, about, it was trying to center or focus on, um, well, that's just stem on stem and stem, stem, stem on stem is no longer a problem. Uh, it, it was paying attention to stem on stem was missing the point that it doesn't meet any of the criteria for a spray as far as I can see. Then if you have the picture in front of you, it's, it's right, you can see what I'm saying. If you don't have the picture, it's a bunch of words. Ed, this is Don Myers. I never saw the picture. Could you possibly send it to me? Do you have it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I do. I, I saved that from the uh, presentation last week. Great. I'd like to see what we're talking about exactly. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you want it right now or uh, whenever I get to it? I can send it to you when right you now. It, when you get to it, it's fine. All right. You have Good my enough. email? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I did just get it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for sending it. Okay. Sorry about that. I unmuted myself and didn't. I don't see any more questions right now uh, inside with their hands raised up. Uh, and so, uh, if there's not any more questions, I want to thank everyone. Uh, we got one more. Sorry, I'll get that one real quick. And that's Tom Mayhew. Tom, there you go. You're unmuted. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Bill. Nice presentation. And Don, nice Thank to you. hear from you. Um, my question has to do with the sepals up, sepals down. Um, I believe it used to say that the sepals had to be um, down below, lower than horizontal. Yet in past row shows, particularly in the mini classes or mini flora, often the sepals were up you know above the horizontal and and they were still getting blue ribbons and it seemed to be generally accepted for the small roses so i was wondering if you could clarify that um what it says now about sepals up sepals down did you hear my question yes the sepals should be parallel to the plane yeah that's what i'm saying the rules have not changed about that. Yeah, I that's think what's what I, happened, I, I've seen the same thing that in many cases, in many floors in particular, the sepals are up where they should be at the level of the plane. And uh, that should not be rewarded. But it seems, you know, like practice, it seems like general practice what has happened is yeah for the small roses like you say you've seen that that um it seems to be ignored by a lot of judges and um uh, you see on the court beautiful roses that are you know really big buds so to speak um you're right the judges need to be reminded of the rules frank would always say they're damn tulips <laughs> tulips, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, tulips. tulips. Right. That's what Frank always called them. <laughs> anyway, thank you. you. It is sequels down, horizontal or lower. All yes. right. Sorry. We're going to move on to the last question. And the last question for today was with Marilyn Whitaker. Marilyn, I'm muting you now. Go ahead and ask your question. 
Bill said at one time he was faced with St. Patrick that were partially green and partially yellow. I I wanted to know how he judged that. Oh, I, I didn't judge it. I uh, it was a national show I was attending. Um, they ha actually had them separated on a table. Half of the table had a yellow and green color to it, and the other half had the yellow with the peachy color. Um, it just depended where they were grown. Um, fortunately, at that time, I wasn't a judge, so I didn't have to worry about it. But um, you would just judge them and typical to where they're grown, I guess. Um, you know, some some were grown where they had the green, some had that kind of apricot color to them. So um, they would have to be judged on their own merit. Um, you couldn't say the green ones were better or the apricot ones were better. Um, you would have to just, you know, use your rules for judging and, you know, consider each color typical for where they were grown. Oh, okay. That kind of surprises me. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. We're so glad you're a part of the American Road Society. Uh, we will be posting uh, this uh, webinar on our YouTube channel in the next week if you want to view it. Thank you once again and have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.